Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, elevating your wildlife photography, an ethical and practical approach. Presented by professional photographer and guard, Arthur Le Leforeste, also known as Arthur Lefo. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Arthur. Thanks, Rob. And thank you to everyone joining me today uh, for my first NetHab webinar, and certainly won't be the last, um, but excited to dive into the world of wildlife photography with you guys. Um, once again, my name is Arthur Leffo. Um, I'm a professional wildlife photographer for OM System, formerly known as Olympus Cameras. Um, I am an Alaskan bear guide in the summers, and I am a Wyoming wolf and wildlife naturalist guide. Uh, in the fall and winter seasons. Um, really excited to be here with you all today. Really excited to share a little bit of my vision on wildlife photography um, and hopefully inspiring some of you to apply some tips and techniques in the field to elevate your wildlife photography. Um, a quick overview of the presentation today, uh, what it's intended to do. Um, really, this is sort of a general wildlife photography uh, presentation that I think anyone can get something out of, whether you're looking to buy your first camera or whether you're a seasoned wildlife photographer traveling the world several times a year uh, in pursuit of beautiful wildlife images. Um, so really um, focused on some bigger topics, um, starting with the ethical approach, right? Putting ourselves into the right mindset uh, in order to capture wildlife photos and create our own luck, so to say. So I'll dive into that on the first part of the presentation. And then in the second part of the presentation, we'll have a bit more of a practical approach. I'll go over some general camera stuff and then four tips that I think are crucial for any wildlife photographer, no matter your experience level, uh, for you guys to apply and um, integrate into your creative process in the field. Um, followed by three images at the end that will kind of tell you guys the story behind the shot. So without further ado, thank you, thank you guys again for joining. Let's get started. Um, we'll start with this, these three words, silence, stillness, wilderness. Now, if you repeat those words mentally, they're three words that really embody the essence of wildlife photography, the, the ethos, so to say, um, as far as I approach it and as far as I think it's best approached by any of us. Silence, right? paying attention to the world around us, stillness, noticing the details, not moving too fast, not rushing, and wilderness, right? The wildness of the world around us. And I think that this is kind of the general, um, um, again, mantra that I keep in mind when I'm going out and about in the field. Um, and, and with every side I'll present, I'll just give you guys a quick, quick little excerpt on the photo. This is a, a juvenile bobcat uh, that we had a chance encounter with in the Northern range of Yellowstone. Uh, in the winter of 2022, so a year ago. Um, not a very common animal to see in Yellowstone, nonetheless an incredible encounter. So we'll start with this, let the wilderness find you. Um, so as wildlife photographers, we're all probably passionate about nature. We all love wilderness, we all love nature. And that's sort of what's brought many of us into this uh, photography field in the first place. Personally, I describe myself as a wildlife photographer first, or sorry, a nature lover first and a photographer second. Um, so really it starts with wilderness. Um, and if we break down the term wildlife photographer into wildlife and photographer, I find that the most common mistake that most people make is they tend to focus in on the latter part of that term, right? Photographer, the pursuit of a shot, the desire to create something. Right, and we tend to hyper-focus ourselves and kind of pigeonhole ourselves into this uh, mentality that we need to go out and create something, which is nothing but detrimental to our creative process. Um, so by focusing on the former part of the word, wildlife, which we can then further break down into wild and life, um, the wilderness around us, the, the flora that thrives, these beautiful, incredibly inspiring areas that we're surrounded by um, either on our trips um, or in our own backyards, and then life, right? All the, the, the fauna that thrives in these environments. By focusing on this, we can sort of slow down a bit and help us get into the present moment, um, which is the first step to really um, creating our own luck and seizing opportunities. Um, the most useful tip uh, anyone's ever given me 
as I was getting into wildlife photography is to remain opportunistic, to be mindful. Um, we don't have the luxury as wildlife photographers to be working with malleable subjects like portrait photographers. I can't ask a bear to stand and look cute with its, its fan on its hips. Unfortunately, I'm at the mercy of the animals and it's this beautiful dance that we have with the animals around us um, that allows us to both exist around them uh, in a way that's respectful and ethical and also create these incredible images. Um, so remaining opportunistic, right? Seizing the moment when it's presented is really the center of wildlife photography. Um, from a quick note on the animal's home, um, when we enter nature, whether it be one of these incredible areas that you might be visiting on a bucket list trip with Nathab, or whether it's uh, the state park in your backyard, as soon as we enter nature, we are entering the animal's home. And I think that the sort of core of our mindset needs to be centered around that. When we enter the home of a stranger that we don't know, let's say we go over to someone's house to have dinner, uh, we act very respectfully. We think about every little detail. We um, you know, think about the way that we're cutting on our plate to avoid making noises. Every little thing we're paying attention to, to avoid being uh, rude in any way. And this is very much the mindset that I'd like to encourage you all to adopt when you enter wilderness or nature, um, because it puts you in the right mind frame, right? A, a mind frame of respect and a mind frame of being grateful that the animals are in fact welcoming us into their home. Um, and then of course, leaving it how you found it. Um, many of you have probably heard of leave no trace principles, but leave no trace meaning you enter a world that is wild and beautiful. And when we leave it, we will leave it equally wild and beautiful. Um, so that's that's the first tidbit. Now on this photo, um, this is a, a young black bear in Grand Teton National Park that was photographed in September um, as it was climbing hawthornberry bushes in search of its last few meals before it starts to prepare for hibernation. So continuing this dialogue of putting ourselves into the right mindset. Um, know where you go. So preparation enhances application. I can't stress enough how much the preparation that I've put in beforehand before going into the field, whether it be on a guided trip or on your own into your own wilderness area, how much preparation allows us to be more mindful and notice more details in the world around us that will inevitably lead us to creating more opportunities for ourselves and to seizing those opportunities. That starts with knowing your subject. Um, for example, this can go as far as, as this things as simple as understanding the basic biology of your subject, what they eat, where they live, uh, to uh, relationships between animals of the same species. So for example, black bear to black bear relationships, to relationships between species. Um, for example, um, a beautiful mutualistic relationship in the wild um, exists between wolves and ravens, you know, and a lot of guides have been able, and photographers have been able to cue in on clues as to where a kill may have happened and things like that based on knowledge of the relationships those two share. Um, or another really common one that happens a lot here in the Rocky Mountains, um, not too far from me where I live in Denver, is squirrels ringing the alarms when an intruder in the forest comes along, which sometimes that intruder is us, Sometimes the squirrels are ringing the, the bell to let us know, hey, there's something else in the area. There is a pine marten hiding in a tree or something like that. Um, so understanding all these things along with the seasonal variation in the behavior of these animals is really the sort of groundwork for putting ourselves into the right mindset when we get out into the field to be able to notice things, right? The more you learn beforehand, the more you're gonna notice when you go out. You're gonna go out and you're gonna be like, hmm, well, it's fall, so I'm gonna focus on this area with the hawthorn berry bushes, for example. Um, and getting to know your area a little bit more intimately um, through several times visiting the same area is inevitably gonna lead you to noticing more things, being more present again and being more opportunistic. It all comes back to this. Um, quick note on off-trail travel. I think one of the wonderful things and most exciting things about wildlife photography is the exploration, right? The adventure, the discovery. Um, and so sometimes that entails off-trail travel. Um, I think it's important to just note that off-trail travel is not allowed everywhere. Um, so be mindful of where you're going. Uh, many national forests allow for off-trail travel. Many national parks do not. Um, but in the event that off-trail travel is allowed, 
remain aware and remain respectful as if you were in someone else's home. So maybe use existing game trails, avoid stepping on sensitive plant life. For example, if you're in the Alpine tundra here in Colorado or whatever it might be. Um, so just good things to keep in mind um, as we navigate through the wilderness. This slide is maybe a little bit more applicable to um, your own discovery of the areas closer to where you go or on the trips you might go on your own. However, it's also something that your guide, if you're joining a MADHAB trip in the next few months, will probably go into and would love to um, expand on while you're in the field. Um, so animals leave clues, right? Tracking is maybe the most useful thing to learn how to do outside of photography itself um, to increase our odds at succeeding at wildlife photography. Tracks tell stories, tracks tell time. They let us know when an animal has come here. They let us know what an animal has eaten. They let us know where an animal has rested. They let us know where an animal lives its daily lives and where things have been happening recently, which of course increases our understanding of the area and increases our ability to hopefully capture these animals. Um, so revisit areas, especially areas that you're close to by your house, spend more time walking the same game trails, spend more time day after day, if you have the time, then great, going back to these areas and just becoming more familiar. And the more you go, the more you'll notice. You'll notice on one day, hey, this track wasn't here yesterday, or this willow branch had all of its leaves, potentially a moose stripped the willow of its leaves. All these things and learning about both the biology of the animals, and um, the tracking behind these animals and how they leave clues behind for us to piece together, almost like a puzzle, is really, really uh, an incredibly helpful tool uh, to put us into the best position to create our own luck. Signs of past meals are, of course, great, um, like carcasses, um, like branches that have been stripped of leaves, um, like droppings, uh, scat. Um, and then the bingo, the, the really big key item here that, that as a wildlife photographer I look for is signs of downtime and sleep. Um, for example, moose. Moose are very sensitive to high, high temperatures. You know, you can think of it this way, on a 40 degree day for us, the moose feels like it's 80 degrees, give or take. That's a rough approximation, but a good way to think about how they experience temperature. So they lay down midday a lot of the time, and that's a great thing to cue in on if you're trying to photograph, say, a moose at sunset, for example, right? Finding out where they're resting midday, where they're gonna rise from, where they're gonna emerge from, to put yourself in the best situation to potentially succeed. Um, and then reminding ourselves, you know, time and time again, it's a blessing to be here in and of itself. Um, existing out here in these wild spaces is, is why we do what we do, right? And, and finding time to be, to be grateful for that, I think, is always into, um, conducive to reminding ourselves um, that we are here for this reason, first and foremost, and to remaining present in the moment. So the ethical approach. What is an ethical approach? And this is a topic that's very hotly debated still to this day, right? Um, things that used to be less clear, like feeding wildlife, which we now know is uh, generally not a good thing to do, um, are obvious things here in this discussion, but there continues to be a lot of debate about this. So in my mind, it's really pretty simple. Um, our goal as wildlife photographers is to disturb the world around us as little as possible. Um, that means that no animal is worth altering their behavior uh, in order to get a shot, right? At the moment you've changed an animal's behavior, that is one step too far. And that is when you should rectify um, your behavior, your positioning, or whatever it may be in order to avoid further stressing, or stressing out that animal. Um, so keeping that in mind as we move around um, is important. And on that note, moving around is something we do a lot of, but moving around isn't always the best thing to do. Walking around isn't always the best. Why? Well, there are times where, you know, staying put and staying calm and quiet allows us to cue in on more and disturb less. For example, you probably wouldn't hear a black bear mother ever so slightly cracking a branch behind some dense brush if you were trudging about through the, the bushes. Um, being quiet allows you to do that. You wouldn't hear a squirrel dropping its pine cones from a tree uh, across the meadow as it prepares for the long winter ahead. So all these things allowing us to slow down, remain present and remain mindful of the world around us, thereby increasing our photo opportunities. 
Um, again, no shot is worth changing an animal's behavior. I think that's something important to keep in mind um, as we approach this ethically. Uh, this is a shot of a great gray owl that was taken in the uh, National Forests of Idaho uh, in the winter of 2021. Where the wild roams free. So here we are in these vast, open, inspiring places, and wilderness roams free, and so must we. Um, and I think that um, that begins really with, with keeping this open mind, with not pigeonholing ourselves into one particular thought, right? I, I very rarely go out um, taking photos with a specific shot in mind. I generally go out and I kind of let things unfold. There's a natural rhythm and flow to nature and cueing into that rhythm and that flow is what allows us to create the most intimate and spectacular moments with wildlife. Um, so as we go out, I like to set my expectations for wildlife low um, and my expectations for enjoyment high. Whether you're going on a trip across the world that you've been looking forward to for your whole life or going to explore your backyard, I think setting your expectations low is really such a beneficial thing because at the end of the day, we're just here to enjoy being outdoors, right? And if you set your focus on enjoying your time outside and staying focused on what's going on around you, you're gonna cue into more, you're gonna notice more, and it's gonna lead you down the right trail. Again, we create our own luck using all these tools I've kind of laid out before and some of the tips I'll lay out in the future here in the next few slides, we create our own luck. Um, I think a lot of the most spectacular encounters I've had, the shots that have um, earned me the most success in my career have been shots that have kind of just come about out of the blue, a chance encounter, so to say, which many people would attribute to luck, but in reality is attributed to this preparation, this mindfulness, um, and a few of the tips I'm going to dive in um, here next. So don't force things when we're out there, just kind of let things unfold, let things flow. And now I'm going to talk to you guys about getting the shot, which is why a lot of you are here probably, but really wanted to craft this narrative for the mindset I want you guys to try and adopt when we're going out into the wilderness and pursuing the creation of beautiful, spectacular wildlife images. So for those of you who might just be a little bit newer to um, the photography game, um, just put together this slide. Um, as a quick note on um, some of the things that might be useful in um, both adhering to this ethical approach and then the practical approach I'm about to present. Um, so when you're shopping for camera bodies, keep in mind, mega megapixels give you more room for cropping. Um, I think it's a common um, trap that we fall in to think about our um, screen monitor or the frame that we have as the end-all be-all image. And we have this tendency to try and fill the frame. When in reality, in modern day photography, we have such advanced technology and such sharp um, sensors and lenses that we really don't. For example, this image you see in the background, which is uh, called While the Kids Play, that's one of my more successful images, um, is actually one fifth of the size of the total image, meaning that is a 20% crop. And yet, it's still incredibly sharp, and uh, has been printed in large formats um, with no issues whatsoever. So it just goes to show that cropping can allow you that extra reach when you have enough megapixels. Um, so if you can use a camera that has, I would say at least 20 megapixels, that is a huge advantage already in order to give yourself more flexibility in what you can create out of an image that might be say a little more distant than you had hoped. Um, telephoto lenses also allow you to respect the wildlife. Um, I'm a big advocate for telephoto lenses. Um, I think that, um, you know, whatever you can afford based on your budget is, is just fine. Um, but going for those longer reaches is inevitably going to put you in a position where you're more likely to stay further back, right? Um, which is a good practice and also just gives us different points of view that create compelling imagery. Um, being ready for the elements. Um, I can't tell you guys the number of times that I've created a shot um, that was incredibly impactful after it had been raining for over an hour, or after I had stood in the freezing snow for uh, a couple of hours, you know? Um, so being ready for the elements, both in terms of your gear, so that means making sure your gear is, um, you know, resistant to the elements, or at least that you have stuff to protect your gear. And then of course yourself going out ready and prepared to spend a considerable amount of time in the outdoors is, is a key here. 
Um, because of course, as many of you might know, patience is required for wildlife photography and, and being comfortable is important also to our creative process and our general mindset. Um, quick note on zoom lenses versus prime lenses. Um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer here, but in short, this is how I would break it down for those of you looking to get um, a new lens soon uh, for an upcoming trip. Prime lenses, for those of you who don't know, are basically fixed focal length lenses, uh, meaning you might have a 600 millimeter prime, which means you cannot zoom in or out, right? So you stay, in this case, at 600 millimeters, there you zoomed in. Whereas zoom lenses allow you, of course, to zoom. So you might have a two to 600 millimeter lens, which gives you that flexibility, right? If an animal moves, again, we're at the mercy of the animals as wildlife photographers. So what can we do to increase our likelihood of succeeding? Zoom lenses are a great thing. Now, there are advantages to prime lenses too. They're a little bit sharper. Uh, the image quality is generally a little better. And they also force us in a way to stay further from an animal because we have to keep that distance. However, they can be uh, counterintuitive too because if an animal walks towards you, um, you might be too zoomed in to actually photograph that animal. I'm sorry, that's my cat. Um, so zoom lenses are personally what I tend to gravitate towards, but overall, there's an advantage to each of those. A uh, quick note on settings before I go into the four tips that I'd like to share with you guys today. Um, again, wildlife sightings can be fleeting. Um, moments that are some of the most beautiful photos I've created have lasted just a mere couple of seconds and being ready being opportunistic, again, is really at the center of uh, succeeding at wildlife photography. So making sure your settings are in line with that is definitely um, the number one thing you can do to avoid missing a moment. Quick differentiation between aperture priority and manual. If you're just getting into wildlife photography, you might still be shooting on automatic modes. Um, I would highly recommend you try and make the progression to at least getting to a point where you're comfortable using aperture priority modes um, and eventually manual. Um, when I'm on the move, when I'm moving around, I like to stay in aperture priority. Why is that? Well, aperture priority, for those of you who might not know, basically allows you to control your aperture and your ISO generally. Um, with your aperture set, um, which generally as wildlife photographers, we tend to set our apertures basically as low as they can go. Sometimes we bump it up a few notches, but if you've got a big lens, um, you're generally setting it as low as you can go to allow yourself to have more softness in your image and let more light into your image. Um, so we typically don't really change it much. And what that does, shooting an aperture priority, is it allows us to worry about one setting, i.e. the ISO. Um, to control our entire camera because we're not really touching aperture and through the ISO alone, we can adjust our shutter speed, which is the number one area I see mistakes being made um, in wildlife photography is not paying attention to your shutter speed and having your shutter slightly too slow for an animal that say was running across a field and then you end up with a blurry image. Um, so when I'm on the move, I like to keep my camera on aperture priority because um, again, it allows me to worry about one setting generally, maybe two if I'm making minor adjustments to my aperture um, and, and adapting to my environment very quickly based on that, right? Which mean, makes my reaction time lower. However, manual modes are the best way to create really, really compelling imagery in the end. And these are best used when you're slowing down a bit further, when you settled into a spot, when you're spending more time with an animal, any of these situations where you have time and you can really dial in your settings and work on your image uh, to have it come out exactly how you'd like. Um, so really love giving that tip because a lot of shots are missed by fumbling in the moment when something crazy happens really quick. Aperture priority is great for that. Um, again, wildlife encounters can be fleeting and I think it's good to stay safe with higher shutter speeds unless you're in a position in a situation where you can or have to reduce your shutter speed. Generally, I'm walking around with my shutter speed around 1 640 or 1 over 800, um, so pretty fast, which allows me to capture most things unless they're extremely fast movements like birds um, at the drop of a hat, right? I'm continuously thinking about my environment. So what that means is as I'm walking, say, through a forest where there's more shadows, there's less light, um, I'm testing my 
uh, shutter speed. I'm looking, even if there's nothing around me, I look through my viewfinder, I focus on an object and I see, okay, I'm shooting at one 800th, I'm good. And then you say, walk out into the light so you can make adjustments. So you're walking out into an open meadow where it's quite bright, you make adjustments to your settings and then you walk back into the woods and again, refocus and readjust your settings. By keeping that proactive workflow as you're walking around and navigating, um, you're just staying on top of the game and making sure that your aperture and your shutter speed is at a point where you would like it to be in order to capture any um, potentially very fleeting moments that might spontaneously rise about. Um, so that that's one of the most useful tips I think that um, people get out of these presentations is, is that continuous thought about your, your shutter speed and continuously thinking about the light you're in. Quick note on single autofocus and continuous focus or tracking. Um, a lot of cameras these days have incredible animal tracking features. Um, I'm a big fan of them. I have uh, animal tracking myself on my camera. However, I don't use it all the time. Um, I think there's a time and place for it. You know, when you're um, walking around potentially encountering a fleeting moment, I like to keep it on. Um, but single autofocus, I feel, tends to be overall the most reliable and accurate way to focus and create the sharpest images. Um, so when you have time and you're really spending time with an animal again, or if an animal's not moving as much, single autofocus is a great way to ensure that you know exactly where you're focusing and not relying so heavily on the technology um, and instead um, doing it yourself, right? Sometimes I've relied on the technology and failed miserably, uh, which is just a part of the process. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of dive into my four tips. Um, four tips that I think anyone can apply to uh, elevate their photography. Tip number one, follow the light. As photographers, we are quite simply capturing light. Um, light often determines the photo quality. Um, so we can't change the light, but we can change where we are. And I think that putting ourselves into a position in an environment and circumstances where lighting conditions are preferable um, or advantageous puts us in a position where should we have an encounter in these areas, we are able to capture an image that is more impactful. For example, I could have the most amazing encounter, um, say between two bears playing in an open, a sunny field on a really hot day. And as amazing as it's gonna be for me to witness that and to feel that in my soul and to experience that, um, the photos aren't gonna be great because the light's not great. There might be really harsh shadows, really harsh highlights, um, heat waves coming off of the ground because of the evaporation. Um, all these things that can kind of turn your image, which would otherwise, you know, you would think of it as a spectacular moment, but really won't create a spectacular end result because the light just isn't right. However, if you follow the light and say in the early mornings, focus on those clearings in open meadows, along riverbanks, areas where you might have a little bit more light, that puts you in a position where should you have an encounter, you would have a perfect scenario to capture an intimate and profound image. Um, so following the light, right, um, is, is really uh, a great way to put yourself in a position to succeed um, and to, again, create your own luck in, um, in creating these images. This image here, um, kind of right in line with what I was just saying on this tip, this, this was a day that started off a little, you know, slow because there were some clouds on the horizon and then the sun started to brighten up really quickly. So I headed into the forest and I ended up stumbling into this uh, beautiful black bear um, climbing this tree. Um, and um, because the light was just right where I was, I was able to capture this image, which without a doubt would not have been as nice of an image had I run into a bear in the middle of a field that day. So again, follow the light. My second tip, and um, another one of my favorite tips is subject isolation. Isolate your subject. Um, I think one of the best things to think about is your background. Your backdrop dictates the quality of the image more than almost any other factor, except for the sharpness and the focus on your actual subject. Um, so creating depth, how do we do that, right? Thinking about where is your image where does your eye uh, draw to on your image, right? If you've got, say, imagine a brown bear very close to 
um, leafless brown willows in the, in the backdrop, you're going to have a brown animal on a brown backdrop that's very close to it. So it's all going to kind of get really busy and muddy and you're not going to have the pop that you're looking for, right? The, the wow factor that that backdrop and the depth gives any image. However, if you've got a bear, like in this case, um, eye level with really distant mountain backdrops that allows your camera to capture the softness of the scene, you're instantly gonna have a lot more focus, a lot more attention from your eye drawn to the center of the image where the image is focused, and it's gonna create the image that's an image that's that much more compelling. So how do we create depth? How do we create the softness in our image? Well, I coined this term called the subject backdrop ratio, which is um, a really good thing to keep in mind. It's something I'm always thinking about when I'm out in the field, um, and it's super, super useful. Basically, you can think as, of the subject backdrop ratio as the distance between you and your subject over the distance between your subject and the background. So in other words, the closer you are to your subject and the further your subject is from the background, the softer your image will be, the more depth there will be. Quick note on that, because I know I just said, the closer you are to your subject. That does not mean get closer to your subject. That means shoot for a subject that is ideally further from the background. Of course, we never wanna directly approach animals, so keep that in mind too. But it's a good thing to keep in mind, even as you're just looking around without having to look through your viewfinder as to, how is this going to turn out at the end of the day? How is how am I creating softness, right? You don't have to look through your viewfinder. You can literally just look at an animal and be like, well, the mountains are about a half mile behind it, so it'll be pretty soft. Or there's a tree right behind it, and I'm quite far from it, so maybe that won't be as soft. All these things helpful to continuously think about as you're in the field creating and going through your creative process. Um, sometimes, again, the background isn't really an option, and the foreground can be useful. So getting low, getting eye level, um, using the bokeh of the foreground is also a uh, really good tool uh, to create that softness and create depth in your image and to help isolate your subject, right? The more you isolate your subject, the more you're gonna have impact and focus on the animal and the behavior that they're exhibiting. Um, by the way, this is a beautiful brown bear who last year had four cubs in Katmai, not too far from Brooks Falls, um, if any of you have ever been there. Um, she was an, an amazing bear to, to watch, and if any of you are going there soon, you might be seeing her. So I uh, hope you do. She is a beautiful, beautiful animal. Tip number three, zoom out. The number one thing that we fall into when we buy these fancy, expensive zoom lenses is what I call the zoom trap. We go out, we're excited, we're like, oh my God, there's an animal, and you just want to see closer and closer, and it is fascinating to see the details on an animal. It's incredible what a zoom lens allows us to capture and to share with the world uh, for those of us who are less fortunate and maybe not traveling to all these incredible areas. Um, however, sometimes zooming in is a trap and you miss more of the scene around you. Um, for example, in this image in the backdrop, I, um, to give a little bit of context about this image, um, this was an area I had visited many times in a row back when I lived in Jackson, and I had cued into the fact that these moose were coming to this creek every day in the evening to have a drink. So one day I decided to go out there, and I literally sat and waited in the water um, for about an hour before these moose came back at their usual time. Um, and, you know, I positioned myself um in a spot where i felt would be likely they would come drink and uh, to my advantage they came down about 30 40 yards from me and started drinking and had i zoomed all the way in i would have ended up with an image actually i'll just backtrack a few slides this image here is actually from the same exact encounter um all the way zoomed in right on the same lens however all the way zoomed out as you can tell captures a completely different scene completely different scene and this is something that had I stayed zoomed in and gotten stuck in the zoom trap so to say I would have missed out on this spectacular image which has since become one of my most successful images um, so zoom out use distance to your advantage look at the big picture and I think most importantly take time to reset mid-shoot we have this tendency as photographers to become absorbed by our viewfinders to look through our lenses and basically experience the world entirely through our lenses 
Um, and I can't stress enough how useful it is to put down the camera more and look around more. For example, um, if you're photographing a bison um, in a herd of bison and you have a beautiful big bull bison that's standing stoically in majestic light and you're looking at it through your viewfinder and you're capturing photos and zooming in, you're actually potentially missing out on, if you were to put down your lens, looking a few yards over to the right where you notice a mom and a young calf having a really beautiful intimate moment. So put your camera down more, look at the big picture, zoom in and out, and then of course, change lenses from time to time. Changing lenses even midday is something that I find really, really helps my creative process, um, changes the way I see things, I look at things, and helps continuously drive new ideas um, as I'm creating images out there. Um, so tip three, zoom out. Don't fall into that zoom trap. Last but certainly not least, tip four, small changes, big differences. Um, so this tip, <coughs> excuse me, kind of brings together all of the points that I've brought out before from the mindset of being mindful and opportunistic down to the first three tips I just gave you. Small changes have huge impacts on um, whether a photo turns out good or great. Um, the most common mistake I see people making in the field is once we show up and we have an encounter is people are so overwhelmed with awe, which isn't something to be ashamed of, but you're so overwhelmed with awe and, and wonder that you just stand there and click away. And oftentimes what people don't realize is that these tiny, tiny changes in your positioning in um, maybe it's a few inches, a step over to the right, kneeling down a little bit, have a huge impact on the final image. For example, on the last image with the moose and the Tetons in the background, had I been say four or five steps off to the right or four or five steps off to the left, the alignment of the moose with the Tetons would have been completely different. Would it have been a nice image? Yeah, sure. But would it have been as powerful and poignant as that one is? Probably not. And those small details really have such a big impact on our final images. The details make all the difference. Or in the case of this image, the image that you see here on this slide is the image of a female moose uh, photographed high in the Alpine in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and I uh, ran into her. Um, she was a good distance away through some bushes, which at first, you might think, oh, well, she's behind some bushes, so the, the opportunity isn't great. Well, I zoomed out, not so good. I zoomed in a little better. And with that and some cropping, I was able to capture this image um, using the leaves that were actually between the moose and I to my advantage to create the, sort of this sense of mystery, right? Um, that being said, had I been standing or photographing this maybe an inch or two off to the right, that green leaf right by the moose's eye may have covered the eye and sort of made the image not as impactful as this one might be. Um, so really, really thinking about the small details and never settling into one position. I think the best thing you can do once you think you've gotten the shot, so to say, is to tell yourself, okay, I got the shot, but now how do I make that one even better? Um, always strive for improvement, always strive for new perspectives. And again, keep the animals around you in mind and remain respectful towards them. Um, the two last tips uh, on small changes and big differences is the low point of view. Um, I think a common mistake I see people making is um, standing to take the photos. If, you have, if you're able to kneel or if you're able to lay down, great, or sit or something to give yourself a lower vantage point and becoming eye level with the animal, huge impact on your photos. Um, you would notice it immediately. And the simple fact for that is by getting lower, you're simply increasing the distance between an animal and its backdrop, right? Imagine yourself photographing an animal and you're standing on top of a hill. The backdrop to that animal is effectively the floor behind it because you're standing so high. However, if you're low, you're giving yourself more distance between the animal and the backdrop and increasing the softness and the depth in your image. And then again, using bokeh to your advantage. In this case, using the leaves. Get playful, have fun. So those are my four tips, um, and I'm just gonna quickly, over the next five minutes, go into three shots that um, I'd like to kind of just share a little bit of the story behind the shots. Um, 
and give you guys some insight into the creative process that went behind each of these and how the tips that I've laid out um, so far contributed to those shots coming to life. Um, and then after that, I'll open the floor up to questions. First shot, this is a shot I titled Four Spies. Um, and I think this is this shot is a real testament to making the best out of a less than ideal situation. Um, to put this into perspective, I had spent most of the evening looking for great gray owls in Idaho and didn't find anything at the very end of the day. The sun had set, so it was getting quite dark. Um, there was a lot of dense brush where I found this owl. It was roosting on this tree, um, which is probably why it had taken so long to find it, because as you, as you might know, they have incredible camouflaging skills. Um, but I found it. And what I did is over the course of about 30 minutes, I very slowly and mindfully walked at a safe distance around this owl and found a position where um, I had a clear point of view. Now keep in mind, it's not always okay to walk around, right? But in this case, the owl was roosting, it wasn't disturbed. Um, so I took advantage of the situation and found this one little angle. Now, despite that, there's a lot of noise, a lot of dense brush, the light was getting low. So I was worried about noise in my image shooting at very high ISOs and of course worried about my shutter speed because it's getting dark. Um, and so this image ended up being shot at ISO 4000 and 1 200th of a second. Um, and using the incredible denoise software that exists nowadays um, in post-production softwares, I was able to um, kind of reduce most of the noise and create this image. Um, and that goes to show never pass up a sighting. It's easy to look at a sighting. I can't tell you guys the number of times I've looked at an animal, especially as a guide, right? And I've, I've simply gone, oh, but like, that's cool, but I'll photograph it the next time I see something like that. And then to this day, I've never had that encounter again. So really, really never pass up a sighting. Every sighting is unique. Every wildlife encounter is special and worth cherishing, whether that be uh, creatively through the process of photography or simply enjoying it uh, through your own two eyes. Um, so that's the story behind Forest Spies. Adele. Adele, Adele, Adele. This is one of my most cherished wildlife encounters that sort of defined a lot of the perspectives I have and approaches I have to wildlife photography. Um, Adele is a bear that I named. Um, I spent several weeks going back to the same area um, in Grand Teton National Park um, and getting familiar with this bear Adele that I saw several mornings in a row. She had a, a specific pattern. She liked to go to certain bushes and then retreated to a certain area of the map every day. And so I started queuing in on that again by going to an area multiple times, understanding tracking, um, returning, uh, which therefore increased my learning of the area and also knowing the subject, not just knowing the subject as a species. I think that's something I talked about earlier, but beyond that, knowing your subject as an individual, right? No two animals of the same species are the same, just like us. A bear that is very comfortable around humans in one area doesn't mean that you'll run into a bear in that same area that might be equally as comfortable. That bear actually might not really like humans at all. And so understanding your subjects on an individual level is really such a beneficial thing if you're able to do that in your local area. Um, in this case, silence and stillness was really a driving Factor here, I sat for many hours from afar watching this bear nap, watching this bear eat, and just understanding her better as she would take note of me at a distance and you know, go about her day without a worry. And with time and a lot of patience, I was given this opportunity to photograph her just as she woke up from a nap under a tree um, and gave this beautiful soft gaze as she was smelling um, some people that were actually hiking on a trail up above us about 50, 60 yards away. Um, so really, really incredible um, opportunity that came about thanks to knowing our subject, returning to an area, knowing tracking, and then of course, being patient and being respectful to the animals. Last and certainly not least, um, this is probably my favorite image um, I've ever managed to capture, a favorite wildlife encounter. Um, for anyone who has been or who's looking to go to experience the incredible presence of wolves in the wild, I don't wanna give you guys a false expectation as to what to expect when you're going to see wolves. This was an encounter that happened um, after thousands of hours spent in the field looking for wolves. 
it was a chance encounter that morning, um, but nonetheless, this is something incredibly rare to have a wolf this close and to be able to capture an image like this one. Um, and this one is really a testament to remaining ready for fleeting moments and that continuous thought process of what is my shutter speed at? Am I gonna capture a shot in this moment if I'm presented with an opportunity? Well, in this case, I was actually uh, guiding a private tour uh, in the Northern range of Yellowstone. This was in June. And one morning I was um, kind of wandering uh, down this dirt road in search of black bears because the sun had risen and this dirt road was in the shade. So it was nice light and black bears frequent this area quite often. And so as we made our way down this road, I noticed this big, large black figure with its head down in the grass and my instinct, because I had seen so many bears there in the past and it was a, a good distance away was to say black bear. And then the wolf lifted its head out from the grass and I was like, wait a second, that's not a black bear. I spoke way too soon. That's a wolf. And this is absolutely an incredible uh, sighting. Um, so I was at the mercy of our subject and this wolf kind of spent a total of five, 10 minutes around us, uh, kind of walked closer to the car and then walked around and back up the hill before jumping onto this log and disappearing into the forest. And as it was making its way towards this hill, I had noticed this log and I had told myself, well, if it happens to cross the road and it happens to jump on this log and it happens to look back at me, well, maybe I could have a really cool photo. So I actually switched my lens. I was shooting on a the equivalent of a 600 millimeter f4 prime at the time, and I switched down to an 80 to 300 f2.8, um, which um, was maybe a questionable decision because it was relying on the fact that I would want this animal to be there, right? I didn't want to be too zoomed in because I wanted to capture some of the scene around it. Um, but nonetheless, I switched my lens really quickly. Um, and I adjusted my settings and sure enough, about two minutes later, the wolf uh, walked up that hill and hopped on the log and gave us one last glance. Um, this glance that you see photographed here is maybe a half second um, before it turned around and jumped onto the other side of the log and disappeared. So another testament to being ready for fleeting moments, to making the most out of every sighting um, and to be aware that when you're at the mercy of your subject, staying prepared and being opportunistic is absolutely the best thing you can do. Um, and that's what led to the creation of this image, which I titled Black on Black. Um, with that said, um, that covers most of the topics uh, that I'd like to cover tonight, today, but I wanted to open the floor back to Rob uh, and to questions uh, before uh, we make some closing comments. All right, thank you, Arthur. Now, before we do start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So, can you tell us what camera you are using and what uh, are the megapixels of your camera? Yes, absolutely. Um, I so I'm as I mentioned earlier, I am a professional photographer for OM System, formerly Olympus Cameras. So I shoot exclusively on their cameras and lenses. Uh, these days, I'm using a OM System OM1, which is their new flagship camera, um, and then three lenses. I have a uh, 150 to 400 f 4.5, uh, which is the equivalent because of the crop sensor on Olympus. For those of you who aren't aware, it's 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 tiny. So uh, crop sensor, so it multiplies the actual focal length. So 150 to 400 gets me actually three to 800 millimeters of f4.5. And then I have a 40 to 150 f2.8, which is kind of filling in the lower end of that zoom, uh, which is an 80 to 300 f2.8 equivalent. And then a 12 to 40 f2.8, which is the equivalent of a 24 to 80. Most of the time I'm shooting between three and 800 millimeters. Um, my favorite lens is the three to, or sorry, the 80 to 300, because it gives me the ability to both zoom in and capture some intimate moments or zoom out very quickly like that moose photo with the Tetons and capture more of a landscape scene. Uh, so that's what I've been shooting on. Absolutely in love with that. I love the waterproofing, uh, the resistance, uh, how resistant these cameras are to the elements. Um, and it's, they're small and portable. Absolutely love it. And those are 21 megapixel cameras. Great, thank you for answering that. So uh, what is your target range for ISO? And at what level do you worry about picking up noise? Yep, uh, so every camera body has its own sort of limitations. Um, 
on crop sensors, which is what I'm shooting on, my limitations are generally generally a little bit lower than if you're shooting, say, on a Sony, which has fantastic low light capabilities, um, or the new Canon R5s, which are also fantastic in low light. Um, typically, ISO 4000, which is what I shot that owl image at, is the highest I will go. Um, that being said, like I said, I won't pass up any opportunity, meaning I will take a photo at a higher ISO than that, simply to capture the moment and then you know do my best. I'm not expecting much out of it at that point, but I will take a photo regardless. Um, I find that anything over 4,000 though, I've struggled to reduce the noise in post. The ideal range of course is between 200 and you know 1600, maybe even 800, but that's very much dependent on lighting conditions. You did mention using an AI program to help with noise. Can, can you mention the ones that you like? Yeah, um, I'm a huge fan of the entire Topaz suite of programs. So Topaz, T-O-P-A-Z, is the name of the company, and they have Denoise AI, which is absolutely incredible. I don't even touch Denoise in Lightroom anymore. They also have Sharpen AI, Gigapixel AI. Gigapixel is meant to upscale an image that's, say, too few megapixels. Um, you know, those can be hit or miss, but I think that Denoise AI from Topaz is a must have in any photographer's uh, repertoire. I pretty much don't publish any images without running it through Denoise these days. Even if they're shot at pretty low ISO, I feel like it helps just give it a bit more of a crisp look. So what are your thoughts on shooting in burst mode? Um, burst mode is generally what I'm operating under. now. Depending on what camera you're shooting with, you might be shoot, setting your burst modes at different rates. Um, for example, if I'm shooting birds, I'm shooting at much higher burst rates. Um, the camera I'm using now has can shoot up to 60 frames a second burst, um, which is incredibly fast. So, you know, if you're photographing hummingbirds or something like that, that's probably what I'm using. If I'm photographing moose that are walking, I'll lower my burst down to like, you know, 10 or 15 frames a second because nobody needs 60 frames a second of a moose strolling. Um, so it really depends on the situation. Um, but I'm a big advocate for not using single shot modes for wildlife photography, even though this means you come home with more photos that are probably not gonna get used. Um, one of the tips that I didn't talk about that I, I'll just mention here quickly is um, having all these photos, right? You can think of wildlife photography as being broken down into three parts. It used to be two, but nowadays it's three. You have going out into the field and actually getting the photo. You have coming home and choosing the photos, which is the part that most people often overlook is selecting the right image. And then third is processing them, ed editing them, et cetera. When you're shooting in burst, you're coming home with more images. So you have more images to choose from. Um, and for example, this image of this bear in the rain, um, I have maybe a hundred frames of this, you know, the four or five seconds that this bear was walking, you know, and the positioning of the paw and the stance, all that is one specific moment that I chose out of a hundred frames that gave me this image. So you're really just giving yourself more flexibility and more freedom to find that perfect shot. Again, small details make big differences in images and, and by shooting in bursts, you're, you're increasing your ability to do that. Do you ever use a tripod? Um, yes, um, generally a monopod. So I think, again, that goes back to what you're shooting on. Um, uh, OM system cameras, which is what I shoot on, has uh, industry leading image stabilization, it's seven stops of image stabilization. So most of my shots are handheld. Um, it's very, very rare that I'm in a situation where I'm too zoomed in um, or that the camera isn't able to compensate for the movement with the image stabilization, uh, that I can't capture a sharp image. Um, I think that monopods help me in lower light or when you know it's uh, something that I really need to, to uh, be a little bit more still for, like if I'm trying to get movement in the river or something. Um, and then tripods these days, I generally use mostly for video. Um, however, if you're shooting on a camera that doesn't have image stabilization, then I would absolutely recommend at the very least a monopod. I think monopods generally do the trick. They're a little bit more portable and less clunky too than the tripods, right? You can adjust your angles a little bit quicker, quick, more quickly and be a little bit more swift, which is beneficial to seizing that moment and being opportunistic. 
Um, so I, I would suggest monopods um, for most cases um, and tripods if you're just looking to you know put up your gear and not have to worry about it or hold it or whatever. Um, so it depends. It really depends on the situation. Do you ever use filters? I don't use filters when I'm photographing wildlife. Um, I have used some sometimes for landscape images, but it's pretty much just the lens as it comes out of the box when I'm photographing wildlife and when everything else comes together in post. Are there any scenarios where you would choose to shoot at a smaller aperture? Uh, yes. If by smaller you mean um, not wider, but yeah, a narrower aperture, which is why I, what I assume the um, asker meant. Um, yes, for example, moose have these crazy big beautiful antlers, and if you're relatively close to a moose shooting at say f 2.8, um, you're not going to get all of the antlers in focus because the small difference between you know where its eyes are, for example, and where the points of its antlers are behind, um, mean that the camera isn't focusing entirely on all of the animals. So with animals like moose, I'll bump it up, you know, to maybe f5.6 to try and get more of the animal in focus. Um, and then of course, anytime I'm composing an image that uh, that's a bit less portrait oriented, um, and what I mean by that is that as wildlife photographers, we're pretty much just portrait photographers for animals most of the time. But sometimes we zoom out like that moose photo, for example, and we capture a landscape within it too. Um, and um, changing your aperture then, for example, in that moose shot um, with the Tetons in the background, my aperture was at 7.1. So I wanted to get a little bit more of the, those mountains in focus. So I do play with it depending on the situation. Um, generally, it stays pretty low, but there are moments and situations where it can be beneficial to raise it. So if I were going on a trip, Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any suggestions on what I should bring for camera gear? Should I bring two bodies and a variety of lenses? Or can mm -hmm. you just give me a little guidance on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you have two bodies and multiple lenses, I am a big fan of that. Um, having two bodies and say in two lenses allows you to have two different setups, two different focal lengths at the drop of a hat. You can just grab one, grab the other instead of having to swap the lenses, which can be stressful if it's raining or something, you know. Um, so I definitely am an advocate for having multiple lenses um, and multiple bodies. Of course, not everyone can afford multiple bodies. Personally, I shot on one body for the first three years of my career and did just fine. Um, but I definitely think at the very least having multiple lenses covering um, some of the shorter ranges and then some of the longer ranges is super useful. Um, before you set out on the trip. So multiple cameras, ideally, multiple lenses, definitely. Um, and then making sure you're ready. You know, I can't tell you the number of times people have realized that their SDs fill up faster than they thought they would. Having extra SD cards, extra, extra batteries, everything that could go wrong, having a spare of, um, of course, with the exception of very expensive items like bodies and lenses is beneficial. Great. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, yeah. that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'm going to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks again, Rob. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, again, my name is Arthur Leffo. You can find me on Instagram at Arthur Leffo um, or my website, ArthurLeffo.com, where um, I have a few of my images up for sale. Um, but in the meantime, I hope to see some of you on a natural habitat adventure soon. Um, I will be doing more webinars in the future, um, sort of a more technical wildlife photography one where I'll expand on some of these concepts I've started presenting today and dive into more. Um, I'll also be talking about bears specifically um, as we approach the Alaskan summer and I'm getting ready to make my way up to Alaska. So lots more to come. Thanks again for joining. Uh, it's been a pleasure and feel free to reach out to me by email or Instagram or any which way. If you ever have any questions, I'm always happy to chat. Um, and hope you guys have a great day and get out there and shoot, have some fun. Arthur, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. Absolutely. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHap, 
give us a call at the number on your screen or send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.